Hello, everybody. This is Hyperwave Lucid Investment Strategies. Socrates and I uh, are going to take a look at this metals market today, uh, the gold market, the silver market, also the mining market, and uh, look at the relationships between all of them because there's some very interesting things developing. Um, as you know, we have been in and out of gold uh, several times over the last couple of years, uh, never more than about 10%, usually 5% in the bullion and 5% in the mining shares. But uh, we end up getting out at uh, basically break evens after attempting to run up to 1380 on gold keeps petering out at 1350, 1340. We're playing around with that 1340, 50 area right now. You heard us talk about it from kind of a bigger point of view uh, yesterday that there's all kinds of very big patterns developing over the last five years. Uh, we still are in a bear market relative to the fact that five years ago we were up at $1,900 and it came down sharply to 1100 and then it basically gone sideways. Um, but it's been a very uh, seductive sideways because it looks like it's going to break up. Then it looks like it's going to break down and then it goes the other way again. Um, my sense is that we're getting very close to a potential breakout to the upside. That's what we've been talking about. We have not bought any yet. I'd like to see some more evidence. Uh, you can only get slapped around so long by uh, various asset classes and, and you've just got to take it easy, which is what we're doing right now. We do have a lot of clients that own a lot of bullion, both gold and silver, a lot of clients that are very interested in the mining shares. So I thought we'd pull it all together today and also look at silver. We've got a lot of silver buffs out there in Twitter land as well as... Uh, in our telegram. So let's just start real quickly. We're also going to look at platinum and palladium because a couple of people asked us to do that. Uh, we'll do that uh, sort of towards the end. They're kind of in their own little world, as everybody knows. I'm mainly interested in gold. I don't think silver is going to play a role in any big macroeconomic uh, thing other than it could get pulled along with it. And I would, I would uh, assume that platinum and palladium would also to a certain extent. So we'll take a look at all of that. And then at the end, um, we're going to, of course, take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is struggling again after trying a couple of times to break to the upside. It's now right back to where it's trying to find a bottom in that 75 to 76 area that we had been talking about. So let's start with gold. I'm going to do a uh, first of all, I'm going to say hello to Socrates and let him uh, say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, happy to be here today. I've got my notepad and my pen handy. I'm planning on taking some notes today myself, uh, something that I have <clears throat> noticed in the past with uh, how Tyler analyzes gold is that he will take it a step further beyond just the price of gold and analyze the price action with the gold miners um, as it relates to the price movement in the uh, commodity markets. Um, so that's something that I think uh, a lot of us can learn a lot from. And I'm going to be uh, taking notes today and, and definitely uh, learning from, from what Tyler is going to be going over on those uh, mining shares and how he uses that information to um, uh, come to a conclusion about what he thinks is going to happen with gold and, and potentially silver as well. <laughs> Terrific. Great. I will jump on screen share and pull up... Uh, there's going to be a bunch of charts today, um, but we're going to start with uh, just the gold as uh, it shows up on the XAUs, uh, which is uh, the chart I've been using. And we, we won't go over everything we've done before uh, because what we're really doing is some comparative work today with uh, similar assets or those that uh, move with with gold just to see are they telling the same story um, remember on the monthly what we're talking about 
is really a hyperwave-ish, and I keep saying an ish because there's some funny things about it I don't love. However, uh, it meets the pretty much all the criteria. Um, and uh, if this was the four, which I believe it was, this is a five down, this is the six, and we're working on a seven, we held at the phase three line, we have not come near the phase two line. Now I'm talking about breaking to the upside. Um, so there's some inconsistencies in that from a long uh, point of view, but I just want to use this chart um, because that's the one I have been using. And let's just see um, this recent action. I don't like the way that looks. I'm going to pull this side down a little bit like that. That looks better. Um, gigantic triangle, ascending triangle, coming up to the top again for the one, two, three, fourth time. It hasn't gotten all the way up there yet. Uh, it's not a great two-point line, but I think everybody agrees with Socrates that that's close enough for government work. And so we're getting squeezed, and we're not being squeezed on a daily or weekly basis. This thing goes back all the way uh, to 2014, the beginning of this pattern. And we do have highs above highs above highs, excuse me, lows above lows above lows, and constant highs. So it could be a very powerful pattern. You do not want to break down out of that. But if you break up, watch out. And uh, then we talked about other things like a giant inverse head and shoulders with either one or two shoulders with the head down here that has targets up around 1,600. Okay, that's the overall big long-term view of things. And um, one of the things I wanted to do is... I want to put up a GLD chart. It's going to look very similar. I don't have all those funny lines on it, though. And this, again, is close enough for government work. This matches very closely the XAUs or the rolling futures markets. And the reason I want to bring this one up is um, what I'd like to do is I would like to compare it to the SLV chart, which is the silver chart. And if I go SLV GLD, what we have is silver relative to the price of gold. And Socrates is going to go into a lot more detailed analysis of this. But um, when this is going down, that means silver is underperforming gold, and when it's going up, it means that silver is outperforming gold. And you can see going all the way back to 2016 uh, what has been happening. And there have been a lot of people talking about that, uh, but I'd like you to visualize that we are not talking about precious metals doing the same thing. They influence each other greatly, and uh, but that's a different story. Now what I'd like to do is take a look at the same chart of SLV, but this time I'm going to divide it by the mining shares, the GDX. A little bit different story here, because now what you're looking at is... Uh, silver relative to the gold mining shares is double bottoming or attempting to, but you can imagine what's going to happen if this line can't hold. If you can't imagine it, let me tell you what I think. It's going to go much lower. What's going to go much lower? Not the price of silver, but the price of silver relative to the price of the gold mining shares, the GDX. The GDX is just an ETF that includes a number of mining shares. Most of them are basically gold, but there's some silver mining shares in there too. But we're talking about mining shares relative to the bullion price. Uh, that was not always the case 
of going from the top to the bottom, as you can see here, from 2010 up, silver did very well relative to the mining shares. But now we've got all kinds of problems. I'm, we're not going to go into all the technical details, but I'm just giving you just a mental picture of kind of where we're going with this today. Um, and I wanted to do one other thing, which was the gold price relative to the gold mining and silver mining share price, GLD versus GDX. A little bit more of a movement up here compared to what we just looked at with the silver price versus the GDX, but it's not um, and, and it's also that gold prices were strong relative to mining shares going up and then gold prices got creamed by the mining shares as they caught up and now gold prices again are rising. But what's important is where the price is on a weekly basis here relative to the top. Remember where gold itself is right now relative to the top. Gold relative to the top is right at this overhead resistance. All the way back in 2011 and 2012 when the, the all-time high was hit, that's a different story. But over the same 2016 period that we just looked at, the gold price itself is right at its all time over this period highs, whereas um, the gold relative or the silver relative to the gold, the gold mining shares relative to the gold are not. And uh, that's an important distinction. Um, I'm going to let Socrates do the sh uh, short and intermediate term work and also some uh, some observations. We covered a lot of the the longer term stuff in our uh, last couple of vlogs. But what I do want to do is I want to pull up about 10 uh, mining shares. And the ones I've picked out, and don't hold me to this, but these are basically the biggest components of the XLE. And we want to take a look at them as a group, which is what the XLE is doing. So let's just put that up by itself first. This is the ETF made up of mining shares. Um, and it's mainly the bigger ones, but there's some small ones in here too, in terms of the top holdings of the XLE you can just uh, take a look at that. Uh, uh, you can just Google it and find out what all the components are. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, first of all, nowhere near the highs the way gold prices are. In fact, very close to the lows over this period starting 2015, 2016. Very different picture. But now, keeping that in mind, let's just take a look at some mining shares. This is Anglo Gold Ashanti. Uh, the symbol is AU. That goes back to 2012, but you see a lot more volatility, both on the upside and the downside. We're only about halfway up on this one, but keep that in mind. The first one we're looking at is about halfway between the lows and the highs as opposed to the XLEs as a group of all the mining shares, which are closer to the lows over this period. This is Kirkland Lake Gold from late 2015 to the present. Don't need to explain that this is going crazy. How is that possible? When we're talking about bullion and gold and silver, how is uh, one mining company, the Ashanti, 
close to lows and this thing has moved over the same time period from two bucks up to 40. Well, obviously there's fundamental reasons for each company. Remember both of these though are in that XLE. So you've got one near the lows and one that is breaking out to new highs, which is one reason when you play mining shares, gold mining shares, number one, don't think of them as moving in concert with each other and with gold prices or silver prices. Number two, you need to do work on individual companies on a fundamental as well as a technical basis. Here's one of the biggest ones in the world. This is Newmont Mine. And uh, Newmont Mine is halfway between the lows of 2015, 2016 and the highs that it hit. But it's been in basically a very narrow range. Doesn't look like the first company, mining company, the second co mining company. Here is AEM. Newmont is NEM, by the way, for those that don't know it. AEM is Agnico Eagle Mines, a lot of silver. Uh, for those that don't know it, gold and silver tend to be in the same sort of deposits. You get one and you get the other. Sometimes you're very heavy on the gold side, sometimes very heavy on the silver side. So uh, each of these companies has their own specialty and you need to know what that is and what percentage uh, of uh, gold and silver they mine uh, and what they have in reserves and all that sort of thing. But anyway, a very different look on another uh, impressive company that's done a lot of things over the years. Now look at this one, El Dorado Gold, EGO. Not only is it near the lows of consolidation, but it just keeps on going as opposed to these that are trying to figure out which way to go and these that know exactly which way they want to go. These are not homogeneous and um, they're put into the ETF or into some mutual funds. You can buy mutual funds that specialize in gold mining shares. And there are some very, very good ones. We'll do a whole show on um, which ETFs, which mutual funds that I prefer and traded for the last 30 or 40 years, not ETFs, of course, but mutual funds. I know a number of the managers, some of them have gotten out of business while I keep uh, plodding along doing my thing. But um, uh, you need to do research for the reasons I'm trying to show you right now about don't just talk about buying mining shares when you're talking about the bullion either gold or silver um, the gold or silver can be doing much better than the miners can be doing much worse than the miners and the miners as a group are all over the place all of the time okay this is kirkland lake again we just look at ego which doesn't mean it's not a good buy. It, it might be a great buy. All I'm doing is giving you a visual, uh, which is the way I like to approach all asset classes uh, where people seem to believe that there's a homogeneity and there almost never is, but uh, almost none are as dispersed as what we're looking at now. This is Alamos Gold symbol AGI, sort of midway to the lower side, KGC, which is Kinross, another huge mining. None of these except the one we saw, the Kirkland, is doing what gold and silver are doing relative to the rest of uh, the chart and relative to gold and silver. Kinross is KGC. MUX is McEwen Mining, uh, not quite as horrible as EGO was, but uh, if you've been holding this, you're bleeding very badly and wondering why. Uh, that This isn't what the overall ETF looks like. It's not what a grouping of mining shares look like. It is one of the weak sisters along with 
uh, EGO, IAG, I am gold, um, looks very similar to MUX. MUX is worse. IAG though is clearly in the lower portion of the of the chart. And we're talking on a stock like this at two dollars and fifty cents after back in beginning of 2018 being at seven bucks. So we're not talking about five or ten or fifteen, twenty percent difference. These are enormous swings. This is called Sandstorm Gold, S-A-N-D, S is in Sam, A-N-D. Closer to the highs, um, looks a little like the bullion does, except it needs to be up here more. And then I just thought I'd pull up quickly this, which is the Junior Miners GDXJ which is an ETF I often buy if I want the smaller mining companies without the big heavy Kinrosses and Newmonts and um, um, ones like Anglo Gold, Ashanti and some of the others. Uh, the GDXJ is the baby sister or brother of the GDX. One of them, uh, has a lot larger mines, some small mines and mid-sized mines in them. GDXJ, J stands for junior. It's considered the junior miners. And again, it's in the lower half of the range relative to the other ones. So uh, I wanted to go over that fairly quickly just to give you a view that um, if we get a breakout on gold, and I'm going to just quickly go back to the gold and the silver by itself. Here's the gold again. Here's the GLDs looking almost exactly the same. And here's silver right now. We did a gold-silver comparison, but silver isn't ready to break out a uh, up above its tops. Uh, it's down in this $14 range and it needs to be up around 20 or 21 in order to be doing what gold is doing. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do now is I am going to go off screen share and let uh, Socrates take a look at uh, his charts i'd be interested to see i know he's been doing some comparison of the gold and silver charts yeah absolutely i'll be more than happy to jump in uh, before that a uh, quick question for you um say that you decide that tomorrow you want to buy gold that you want to be invested say a uh, hundred percent of whatever x is you want to be long gold tomorrow what percentage are you going to be using to buy mining shares versus bullion or just a straight GLD sort of ETF? Well, what I will probably do, I don't know now because I want to see it happen and I want to see how everything is reacting if it does happen. I assume what I will be doing is just buying gold, GLD uh, or uh, through mutual funds. There's some, some great mutual funds and there's some closed end funds. There's one called the Sprott, uh, um, they used to be called the CEF, Central Fund of Canada. It was bought by uh, Sprott. Sprott was, is now a part of a bigger operation. Um, but you can look up SPROTT. They've got both mutual funds and ETFs. And the CEF is a, a very interesting one. It's been around for decades and decades. Central Fund of Canada which is a closed-end mutual fund um, or a closed-end fund um, that keeps the holdings all in bullion, either gold or silver, but in the ratio of the gold and the silver price. It's constantly rebalancing their holdings back to that price. And um, so anyway, uh, what I would probably do is I will probably be buying just the gold bullion 
in the form of a fund. And um, I would wait to see that that breakout is accelerating to the upside and then how everything else acts. Everything else being silver, mining shares, major shares, majors and, and juniors. And then I would be buying the mining shares that are already lagging big time and the silver that's already lagging big time because I think it could be a bigger percentage pop, but I want the safe stuff first, which is the gold bullion itself. So if uh, it, my target is 10%, which it has been in the past as a starting position, I would probably put 10% of an entire portfolio, whatever the size of the portfolio into gold, if we break out above the $1,400 area, 1380 to 14, uh, I would increase that over time as it proved itself out as a percentage of an overall portfolio. I have had as much as 50, 50% of overall portfolios in the metals market before. Um, even not in institutional accounts, of course, because I was limited to uh, weightings relative to industries and all of that sort of stuff, but with individual accounts, with retirement accounts and that sort of thing. So what I'm saying is uh, I am very excited about the possibilities of a breakout to the upside. I do not put that at 50-50 at this point. I am 50-50 that we could break down to new lows and drop below 1,000, break above 1,400 and keep on going. So this is no advice for anyone. What we want to do is prepare everyone that listens to us to understand how important these moves are in the gold and the silver market right now. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that response. I am going to be pulling up my screen here in just one second. Okay. Sharing screen, we go boom, and then we go boom. <laughs> All right. Um, so first thing I want to take a look at is um, why I do not think that gold is a hyperwave. It is very close, um, but I just do not think that it qualifies for two important reasons. Uh, first is this uh, phase two action here. And it is very generous to label this as a valid phase two when we had this um, set in place beforehand. So we broke out of phase one, we connect the breakout uh, with the first higher low, the first major correction. And then that holds for multiple touch points and provides a potential uh, phase three looking type of move. And then it comes and breaks down, closes below this area and kind of find support out of nowhere. Basically a horizontal right here around 690 or so is where it found support. Um, so for me, this was the phase two. And when it broke down this phase two here, you would have to be very generous to just go ahead and adjust it down here with really no other touch points. Now we've gone from a phase two with what? One, two, three, four, about five touch points down to a phase two with only two touch points. And the second touch point is entirely random. There's no way to prepare yourself for this. Um, in real time, you're looking at this as the phase two. And when it breaks down with the close below, you're out. You're not thinking, oh, how can I adjust this to make it such that I can stay in this trade? Um, so in real time, there's just no way that I could justify moving this to a phase two. As it progressed afterwards, now in hindsight, we may look back and say, okay, well, if that's the only thing that is not going to qualify this as a hyperwave, that may be too nitpicky. Um, maybe we can go ahead and adjust this in hindsight after getting this beautiful phase three that followed. I mean, this thing is just perfect. The angle, multiple touch points, it's real tight, real close to that phase line. Um, so now we've got a legit phase three. Now, okay, maybe we can go ahead and go back and adjust this um, in hindsight because we've got such a good phase three. We've got this phase one, this little area here that's only a couple candles. Okay, let's go ahead and adjust it. 
Next problem I have is this phase four. This uh, is the single weakest phase four that I've ever seen. If we are going to say this is a hyperwave, I have never seen a weaker phase four. So that's another reason why I want to discount this as a hyperwave. Uh, you may rem remember me yesterday or the day before saying that I would expect on the lower end of phase four to return 2X or 100% from phase three's all time high. Um, so phase three's all time high is about 1574 and that is nowhere close to 2X from 1574. That's like, what? what is that? 10, 20% increase. Um, so a 20% increase to me is not a phase four. Uh, so seeing this weak little phase four combined with this very generous phase two leads me to say that this is not a hyperwave. The final reason why I do not think it is a hyperwave is because, in my opinion, the best fit line is a parabola. Tyler has told us that all hyperwaves are trend lines that are linear and that they are not um, para they are not drawn with uh, parabolas. Um, just because all hyperwaves are linear doesn't necessarily mean that all of these patterns are best fit as a hyperwave. They're are going to be some times where a parabola, a parabola or more of a sloping uh, line is the best fit. And in that circumstance, it I think of it as more of a traditional parabola pattern and not a hyperwave. Um, so here we just see the price sticking very, very close. We had this same little area that was the problem. It really makes me wonder what happened. Sure enough, that was right in 2008 when everything was hitting the fan. So right here is a very interesting situation where it fell down below our potential phase two and it also fell below this parabola. Um, so that being said, uh, the phase two maybe is more valid uh, seeing something like this. Um, however, the phase four still is super weak and the touch point that this just seems to me like the best fit line. It, it just continues touching it even right here. It came down, touched it, failed to create a new all time high, but found support there, found support here all the way throughout here. It looks to be following this line as a best fit. So for me, I consider this a parabola opposed to a hyperwave, which is very important because hyperwave will have different targets um, than a parabola. A broken parabola calls for an 80% correction, if I'm remembering correctly, whereas a hyperwave calls for a return to phase one if it breaks down phase two. And if we go with the um, generous phase two that we have here, that would say that gold is in, if, if we were to call this a hyperwave, then we would have to say this is phase seven. And we would also have to say that phase two is broken down and therefore a return to 425 at the phase one is to be expected. If we consider this a hyperwave, that's one of the most important reasons for me why I'm not considering this a hyperwave because I do not consider this a valid phase two that the price violated and therefore should return to phase one. Instead, I am more looking at it um, from this point of view, which still would have a significant correction below this to reach that 80% correction uh, from the all time high. Uh, so that is still calling for lower prices, either pattern. However, um, the, parabola correction of 80% um, isn't near as reliable as the hyperwave. Um, seeing uh, Bitcoin recently rally without returning to phase one has changed the historical odds. If we don't return there, that would change the historical odds to about 90, 99% of hyperwaves that break down phase two return to phase one, whereas parabolas don't necessarily have those same odds. So this being broken down here doesn't come with such a high likelihood that the target will be met as far as I understand. So those are a few very important distinctions for me. And then I want to go over why I do think that silver is a hyperwave and how that could actually be very important and may give us a little information uh, that can help us understand what's going on right now as it relates to the silver price as well as the gold silver ratio. 
So I've got drawn right here a very nice uh, funky hyperwave pattern that started back in 2000 with the phase one, uh, taken off into phase two in uh, 2004. Uh, this phase three is very similar to gold in the sense that you'd have to be very um, liberal to go ahead and adjust it down here. But the bottom line is, is say we call this phase three and it breaks down. Well, it doesn't ever return to phase two and find support above. So therefore, it doesn't really matter to me if you draw the line here or here, because either way, it's still a valid funky hyperwave. I draw it down here just because it looks a little nicer than drawing it here and having the four all the way over here. So that is kind of similar to um, gold, but uh, not necessarily because we've already, this already established phase three. And if it broke that down and didn't return to phase two and then goes on to create a new all time high, well, that's still perfectly valid and gives us our phase four, which we see happened in about 2007, 2008. Have a nice five, six, and seven. And look at how perfectly that finds support at the phase two line. I mean, just wicks down and never closes below as a couple wicks below and finds just beautiful support there. We can see how that was drawn from back in here and great support. So now we've got an ideal candidate for a funky hyperwave. We establish a new phase three and then create a new all time high right around here in September of 2010. So right here, we've got a established funky hyperwave. We had a seventh phase, find support at phase two, and then create a new all-time high. That is the definition of a funky hyperwave. And then we take off into phase four shortly after uh, establishing a new all-time high. And then what happens? We get another five, six, and seven. And then look what happens. Uh, first, we find support at the phase three and bounce. Uh, then that breaks down and we return to phase two and we bounce again. Then look what happens here. In 2018, we break down phase two. So right here on July 9th, 2018, uh, that is the, nope, July 16th, 2018. That is the first weekly close below phase two. So for me, as soon as that happened on July 16th, 2018, that calls for a return to phase one. In my mind, this is absolutely a valid hyperwave. It's a valid funky hyperwave that now has a close below phase two, and then it has proceeded to throw back, retest that area and resist it. And now it's coming back down to test this major area of horizontal support at 1380 or so. Uh, so for um, from my perspective, I am thinking that silver should return to about $5.65. So that is based on hyperwave theory. That is based on a close below this phase two, even if the historical odds don't give us um, 100 out of 100. We're still at 99 out of 100 to where the odds are still such that I would be much more comfortable expecting that than anything else uh, based on hyperwave and basically hyperwave alone. And that leads me to wonder, could we experience a situation where gold actually goes up and silver does not? Um, that is something that I find very interesting. Uh, it seems like a very low likelihood. However, from a fundamental perspective, as well as from a technical perspective, it makes a lot of sense to, to me. Uh, so from what I have been reading, and it's my understanding that many central banks and governments have been accumulating gold, and they have been doing it hand over fist. And we're talking big governments, um, China, Russia, even the United States, um, has been accumulating gold to hold in reserve for their central banks. So imagine if there's all that buying pressure and all that demand that is coming into gold from huge money players, and it's not on silver, then uh, from what I understand, the same central banks are not also accumulating silver. They are disregarding it while 
accumulating gold. Uh, so that is something that I find very interesting. And that imbalance of supply and demand as it relates to gold and silver could have very significant effects on the prices. And that is what we're seeing right here. The gold silver ratio, I use XAU, XAG on OANDA, has recently created a new all time high. And that just happened this week within like basically yesterday uh, or two days ago. This ratio has never been uh, this high as far as I know. This chart certainly does not go back very far, but I do not think that before this, the ratio was outside of this range. I think that silver has been depreciating against gold steadily for um, at least eight years. And I think a little bit longer than that, I should have done a little bit more research, but we see from uh, 2011 up until current, um, this ratio has almost tripled. I mean, maybe it has from down to 30 up to 90. It's basically tripled in the matter of eight years. And that looks like central um, uh, that a lot of demand wherever it's coming from, that there's a lot of demand for gold, but there isn't that same demand for silver, um, which is something that just absolutely fascinates me because I have been of the opinion that gold should have been demonetized a very long time ago. I do not understand the value proposition of silver. Maybe it's because I do not have a good enough grasp of the economics behind it, uh, but I have spent a lot of time trying to understand it and it just doesn't really add up to me. So gold is a store of value and it is primarily that way because of its stock to flow ratio and its durability. Silver's primary value proposition was for smaller payments. If you couldn't buy yourself an ale at, at your local um, draft house with your gold coin, you would want to supplement that with silver, which could be denominated into a smaller portion. And therefore you would want silver and gold. You would store your value in gold. And then if you had, if you wanted to spend your money, you would generally use silver for everyday type of items. However, once we came up with paper money, the value proposition of silver basically disappeared overnight. Um, under the gold standard, you can back paper money with gold at a one-to-one -one ratio, whatever you see fit, and then use the paper money to pay for your smaller purchases. So gold, uh, the, the silver doesn't have use case as cash as money and it also doesn't have the same uh, store of value properties as gold so i personally have been wondering when are we going to see a bit of a decoupling uh, with gold and silver gold is sound money silver is not if, if gold wasn't around maybe silver would be the next best thing but gold is around and we have solved the problem of making smaller payments with gold and that's under the gold standard with paper money and then the next advent is bitcoin and bitcoin can be denominated into satoshis and with the lightning network you can pay very very small amounts and uh, do it in a cost effective way so yet again we've got something else that is completely demolishing the value proposition and the use case of silver uh, so the more that that happens and the more people that start to understand or at least uh, view it as I do, the less, the more demand should dry up for silver. And potentially, if the central banks have anything to say about it, the, the demand for gold will not be going really anywhere. So to see gold go up while silver either stays flat or goes down does seem like um, it, it almost is too crazy to, to really happen. Um, it is 
something that I'm going to be paying very close attention to and something that I've actually been expecting for, for quite some time and have been following this chart for quite some time and seeing that we are not wicking down from this 88 to 90 area like we did and we're actually spending some time up here is very, very intriguing to me and something that I will definitely be keeping a, a very close eye on going forward, even if silver does go up and while gold goes up, um, then is it going to be doing it at a much lesser rate such that this chart still continues to make new all-time highs? Now, remember, these are all ifs. We don't know. It's still too early to, to say what's going to happen. These are just ifs and um, sort of um, questions that I'm going to be thinking about uh, to prepare myself for right now, I own gold and I do own some silver, even though I don't necessarily believe in it. I have always viewed it as a greater chance for return. Generally, if it appreciates, it's going to appreciate much more. Um, therefore, I own a little bit. And, and now I'm having to ask myself, do I want to continue um, owning silver uh, as well as gold? Or do I want to potentially go heavier on silver when we're up at these areas where um, testing all-time highs. Is this something that should revert to the mean down here where buying silver would be uh, the, the best bet? So there, there's a lot of ways that you can interpret what is going on. And for me, um, the fundamentals are most important. And also seeing this hyperwave breakdown phase two on silver, whereas it's not really looking near the same um, with gold. Uh, so that is what I'm thinking. Um, anything to add there, Tyler? Well, that's some great stuff, uh, some great observations. Um, I agree with you on the uh, gold hyperwave to a certain extent. That's why I said ish. Um, uh, I also agree that the uh, fourth phase of a hyperwave is usually where the real uh, fireworks take place. Uh, I disagree a little bit on the phase two analysis only because um, what would have actually happened in real time, uh, for those that uh, attended our workshops, a phase two of a hyperwave only becomes a hyperwave about one out of five times. And so when you're in a phase two, you sort of expect it not to uh, become a hyperwave. I would have, uh, the way uh, Socrates is drawing that now, of course, that's the proper way to draw a phase two. And then all the way up to that next point, that looks really good. However, uh, when we came back and touched that after what looked like a phase three starting, then that told you that wasn't a phase three, and now you're back to a one in five chance that this thing's gonna do anything. So as soon as that trend line breaks, I'm out of there because I'm not believing it's a hyperwave at that point. But what's curious to me is then after it reestablishes the uptrend, what I would have done is I would have gotten back into it on the basis that the phase two was originally drawn wrong. And I would still think we're in a phase two. If you drop your uh, old phase two line down to there, that's what I would have done, but I couldn't do that until we take out the old highs of what we thought was the phase three that had begun. So you're, uh, horizontal analysis, uh, I think, is a very important way for everybody. And it gets uh, deep into the woods, I know, but basically, uh, Socrates loves <clears throat> in a hyperwavish situation that when you go through a correction like this one did off of that peak over on the left and come back down and touch lines again. You're not sure where the real lines are until you take out the top. And now by the time you get up there to that horizontal line, you've got a number of touches along a new line that you could designate as the phase three. Now, the other thing you learn in hyperwave land is that when you switch from a phase two to a phase three and you've got 
a number of touch points on that phase three, your odds go way, way up that this thing's going to be a full-blown hyperwave from one in five to uh, 85 out of 100, just with the movement from a phase two to a phase three. So I would be, uh, after the, the touches, as we get closer and closer to that horizontal line, I'd be saying, wow, it sure looks like a phase three. It's the right angle and everything else. So that when we broke above on the big green candle that takes out the, the old highs, now I'm saying this is a hyperwave and this is a phase three. And the phase three, as Socrates said, really helped you out as you climbed it all the way up to where it goes vertical. Now, when it goes vertical, uh, that is a phase four, but you expect it to go much, much higher. It didn't. And when it broke, that's the end of it. So that's why I say ish. It's got so many components that look, smell, and feel like a hyperwave, but it's got a lot of warts and it's missing a couple of fingers. Other than that, if you played it the way you play a hyperwave, you would have done everything right and you wouldn't have gotten hurt even on that acceleration of what you thought was a phase three, when it broke, you get out. And when it gets all the way back to the phase, uh, old phase two line, you say, ooh, look at this. And you're back in when you get back above the horizontal, you stay in, you get the ride all the way up the top, you get out very early and you go, that was the stupidest phase four I've ever seen, but look at my profits and loss. So sometimes you've gotta be creative, unfortunately, this is not archetypical. This isn't what I like to see. What I like to see is what Socrates just showed us on the silver chart. That was fantastic. And uh, there's also on that silver chart, one of the world's largest head and shoulders that uh, the target of that is somewhere close to hell. It's a giant negative number. So for us to get from where we are now at 13 or 14 bucks down to five or six is nothing. That is a piece of cake off of this chart. Also going to zero or close to zero, which would mean some sort of a decoupling, I think on a macroeconomic level, same, same way that Socrates talked about it. Okay, great charts, uh, great observations. Um, what we want to do, and I think I'll just pull up real quickly, platinum and palladium, we're already running close to an hour. We really know how to talk a lot. Um, okay, so what I am going to do then is I am going to go boom, bada, boom, bada, pull this chart up, share, get off of this, too many steps. Get off of this, get into this, stand on my left foot. Oh, that's cute. What the heck happened here? Full feature chart. Who did that? I didn't touch it. Okay, so now we've got to go back. What's that? You danced on the wrong, the left foot instead of the right. Yeah, exactly. I'm on the wrong foot. Okay, so what I wanted to look at is commodities uh right there and i wanted to pull up platinum because some people were asking about platinum uh it doesn't look like gold doesn't even look like silver which doesn't look all that great and uh dropped from 1500 bucks down to 800 um you know what it's done relative to palladium and uh, a lot of people Platinum and palladium are both used in jewelry, but platinum and palladium are industrial metals the same way silver and gold are, but much more so because they're using catalytic converters in all cars that aren't electric cars. And, uh, but more importantly, and originally, they're using catal uh, catalytic converters for converting, breaking down crude oil into its substrata into all of the underlying gasolines and jet fuels and everything else. And uh, it's called catalytic uh, cat cracking or catalytic 
conversion. Um, and, and so is very, very important. Now, some people are speculating that palladium is used more than uh, platinum is in some of the in, in some of the newer vehicles and all of that sort of stuff. I haven't read or un, uh, seen any great explanation of why. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go PL1 backslash XPDUS, which is XPU. DS. Maybe I'm not. PL1 slash XPDUS. XP. Oh, rats. PL1 exclamation backslash CD backslash. PL1 uh, XPDUS, XPDUS. No, kill me. XPDUS. Isn't that weird? I think it's weird. Um, I'm just going to pull up Palladium. For some reason, I can't get it to work unless you can on your charts. Um, okay, here's Palladium. Just coming off these highs at 1600 after this stupid run up, it was outperforming gold, it was outperforming everything. Um, and now it's pulling back a little bit. Platinum that we just looked at is down here at its lows. Palladium is not and is actually stronger than gold. I wonder if I can trick it by going XBD. Uh, nope. XP US backslash. Uh, what did I say? Gold? I think I did. Yeah, GLD. No, for some reason, I think I've, I'm in the wrong set of stuff. Um, anyway, you see what platinum is doing. Now, let me just do a real quick analysis of what I see with platinum because somebody asked us if we were going to look at this. Um, very close to a setup trend line. It's uh, held at one, two, three, four times. Um, we are sitting on a red six. Uh, and we do had, we did have a big candle this week up, wicked up, but now it's given almost all of it back. Below this line, uh, it looks horrible. Um, on a longer term picture, we were all the way up at 1900, about the same time that gold was at 1900. We had actually gotten all the way up to about $2,350. So uh, the Gold is the strongest by far <clears throat> over that entire time period. Palladium has been the strongest recently. Platinum is the weakest of all of, of them. And then uh, silver, remember, silver actually had a spectacular rise up to 48, which was not that different than what it did all the way back into 1970s, where it ran over 40 bucks when gold got up to 880. But just think of it in these terms. When this one got back to its old highs, silver got back to its old highs of the 1970 super almost hyperinflationary period, gold was at 880. This time, when silver got back to the same region, gold was at 1900, 150% higher than it had been um, back in the 1970s. So this underperformance of silver relative gold has gone on for a long time. And uh, we are going to take a quick look at Bitcoin right now. Do you mind if I um, touch on- Yeah, platinum? please. 
Yeah, do you uh, have your own chart or do you want this one? I've got my own chart and I can pull okay, it up here. Uh, real quick. Out of here. Okay, good. All right. First thing that jumped out at me is it kind of looks like a hyperwave. Uh, so taking a look, I'm not sure if we have analyzed that before. I don't remember seeing this being labeled as a hyperwave, but uh, the phase one looks good. Uh, phase two looks great. The angle of the phase three leaves a little bit to be desired. It's very similar to the angle of this phase two. If we go ahead and pull out this phase two, we do see that there is a significant difference there where it does start to increase at a higher rate. Uh, the phase four is absolutely beautiful, just uh, mashes. That's what you want to see, something like this. Um, this is more than, uh, well, I guess it didn't more than 2x, but it was darn close. Um, that is interesting. Uh, so then we've got the five, six, and this seven has been. Um, That's one of the biggest sevens I've ever seen. AT&T did that. No, it &T or AT&T back in the 1930s where the, where the drop was just stupid. Yeah, that, and that also kind of um, reminded me of the GE chart, which has uh, kind of similar action there in the phase seven. Let's see if I can get that pulled up real quick. I guess it didn't drop quite as much, but just seeing the um, big sh sort of bounce and then still yeah. making its way down. Definitely a, an interesting phase seven here, to say the least. And to me, there's really only one thing that matters on this chart, and that is going to be this area of horizontal support, which is waiting in the area of 775 to 796. Um, so for uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is what I would be looking at. Uh, a weekly close below 775 would be a, a very interesting selling opportunity from my perspective. And Absolutely. also just kind of looking at this as, as a similar to a descending triangle. Um, if we go ahead and kind of move this down like so, we do see that it, it isn't ideal deal it doesn't have all these touch points but it's almost more bearish than a descending triangle in my mind um, think of what is a descending triangle it's horizontal support and it's lower highs that's what a descending triangle is so here we've got horizontal support and we've got lower highs lower highs lower highs all these are lower highs that are so much lower that they can't even return to this trend line. Um, so to me, this is even more bearish than a typical descending triangle, whereas if this would have returned here, resisted, came down here, and then returned here, resisted, that would be a pretty textbook descending triangle, um, which is a very bearish pattern. And this, to me, is looking even a little more bearish than a textbook descending triangle because it hasn't even been able to rally back up there. It continues to find resistance below that trend line. So the next thing that I kind of notice is a massive upside down cup and handle. So let's take a look at right here, here, here. And then we've got something like here, here, here. So this uh, uh, cup and handle is a very bullish pattern if it's um, flipped on the other way. Um, here, this to me looks tremendously bearish in the sense that you've got this huge bounce, come back down to support, and now support has gotten so much weaker that it's a much smaller bounce, couldn't even retrace 50% of this, which is what you want to see in a cup and handle. And now we are back down to retesting support. Um, often when it's this big, you'll get multiple handles um, so what I would really expect to see here is maybe another bounce up to about uh, maybe retest a thousand one more time. And then if that resists there with another lower high from here and then comes back down to this area, I would be expecting it to break down. Um, so for me, what I'm going to do is go ahead and just set a price alert um, right here at about 764. 
I want to know when the price goes below there. Um, until then, I think this is just a complete no trade. Um, I would be just waiting for this thing to develop as long as this is support. I wouldn't want to be um, selling it and I don't necessarily want to be buying it while it's still such a clear bear market. Um, so for me, uh, I'm want, wanting to wait for this to break down and indicate uh, if it closes below, then that could indicate a very interesting uh, shorting opportunity or selling opportunity. Other option would be to just go ahead and enter a stop market or a stop limit. Um, when I do that, I would put it completely below all of the wicks um, at about 744 is where I would be comfortable setting a stop market or a stop limit to sell this thing. If this does break down horizontal support, I expect it to move and move fast. And we see just how fast this thing can move. Um, so that's what I'm looking at on uh, Platinum. Uh, Very good. Go ahead and pull up Bitcoin very quickly. <laughs> And I will just take a quick look. Um, pretty, not a whole lot has developed since our last update. Um, we are still finding strong support at this 200 EMA on the four hour chart. Multiple times it's price fallen below, but it is not once closed below. Um, that is supported by this area of horizontal support that I have illustrated. Notice when we came down and tested for support, it wicked, wicked down here, wicked down here, never closed down here. Kind of similar to what we're seeing again, wicks below, wicks below, wicks down in here and closes above. To me, that indicates a lot of demand when you're seeing a horizontal area where price will fall into, but um, spends very little time there. That tells me that people, there's a lot of buyers waiting at the 7,500 uh, 74, 78 to 7,600 or so area um, because anytime the price falls there, it refuses to stay there for very long. And the only way that could be the case is if a bunch of buyers are jumping right in and buying that thing up. Um, so again, we have bounced from here and this 9 EMA is doing its job. We did have a couple closes above, but immediately reacted right back below. So we do see that this is acting as a clean resistance for the most part. Um, so that is just what I want to see. And I would expect right now it's kind of a, a fight. We've got the, the, the 9 EMA in one corner and the 200 EMA in another corner. And I'm always betting on the, the heavyweight, on the bigger fighter, on the longer term moving average. So in terms of who's going to win here, is the 9 EMA going to win as resistance or is the 200 EMA going to win as support? I expect the 200 EMA to win as support and I'm still expecting a bounce back to this 50 EMA. When these moving averages are really spread out, that indicates a very strong trend and it indicates that it will take time to reverse that trend. Um, so here, that's really what we're seeing. This price staying down here, we're, we're spending some time uh, that is allowing the, the trend to start to reverse. Um, however, it's not quite enough time because these still are very spread out. If these were closer, then that would tell me we've spent enough time and it's probably good to continue correcting down. However, seeing this still significantly up here, I mean, this is still up at 81 with the price down at 77. So still about 5% above where the price is and where the 200 EMA is. So that being the case, I still think that we should bounce back up to retest that area. And like I said, I will adjust my arrows based on how much time is passing. I was originally expecting it to bounce up to the 82 because that's where the 50 EMA was. Now that it's moving down and it's moving down rather quickly, I would adjust my expectation. And I would also take a look at a little bit different area of horizontal resistance and see that um, this is coming down pretty quick. Now I'm thinking about 8,000 to 8050 would be where I would expect this to go. And yet again, just pulling up a quick swing target, uh, moving as fast as I can. And we measure the angle and the length of this move here 
to give me my swing target of what I would expect. And that is in line with the area of trend support that I'm seeing. Uh, so that is still what I'm expecting is a bounce to the 50 EMA to basically give us another touch point of the top of this channel. That's about where I'd be expecting now. And then I would be expecting another swing low, which is determined by using this swing target here. I will use closes to make it fit a little <coughs> better instead of the wicks that I was originally using. So that's what I'd be expecting to see there. Maybe a wick down below, close back above. And then um, that would allow this trend to fully reverse on the four hour chart. Um, one quick thing to show um, will be the. ADX recently had a sell signal, and um, on my ADX, I use the plus and minus DI as the um, way to indicate trend. Uh, DI stands for directional indicator, and when the negative DI crosses above the plus di that is a sell signal if the adx is above 20. so here we've got um let's just go ahead and highlight this a little bigger we've got adx uh, negative di crossing above the plus di with this adx still above 20 and now we see it rolling at above 20. Um, indicating that uh, this should start trending down opposed to just continuing to move sideways. If this ADX fell below 20, that would indicate no trend and that um, this was probably a signal that should now be covered um, if you did take it. Um, whereas when it does support above 20 and it looks like what we're seeing here with it rolling up, that does indicate that the trend is going to um, basically continue in the sense that we're not going to be moving sideways. Now we are going to be continuing this downward motion here is what I would be seeing. And notice that that sell signal on the ADX, that was a good signal coming in uh, right here as horizontal was breaking down and as 82 and 81 were breaking down. So that did turn out to be a good signal uh, and seeing the ADX starting to roll and flatten above 20 is confirmation um, that that should continue in this trend opposed to just moving sideways. So that's what I got for Bitcoin. That's great. Could you blow that chart up again? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, the one, I, I hope that we get the bounce that you're talking about back up to the underside of the top uh, parallel line and also your area of resistance. But I would not be expecting it. Um, it's worked very well in the past. The difference is that your uh, intermediate term average was moving up uh, throughout that entire uh, move in which every pullback, even though you would get a couple of little uh, periods where you would break that intermediate term, that's what held it up until this last one. And we broke down and now we've got an accelerating uh, intermediate term trend coming down. So we might not get the chance. I hope we do because I would like to probably get out of the last 10% of longs. I'm not going to do it down here, but I would up there. I just, uh, my, I think it's, it looks to me like it's ready to uh, take out that uh, support area that you have. So this, this will be very interesting to watch, uh, to see how important the direction of the intermediate term moving average is relative to the fact that the longer term is holding up the price right here, as is that green area. Um, when, when I see um, four or five examples of that intermediate term holding so beautifully up to the top, and then finally capitulating that not only took the price below the intermediate term moving average, 
but also below that support zone all in one big candle. And then we haven't been able to get back up to it. And now what we've got is three touches on the top of the next area of support just uh, feels and smells like it wants to uh, roll over. Maybe that ADX is a clue to that. But uh, anyway, great uh, stuff again. And uh, I think with that, we will bid the adieu and uh, we will be talking tomorrow uh, and following all this very closely. Anything that people are interested in zeroing in on in more detail like we did today on the metals or uh, on the market or on Bitcoin, please let us know and we'll certainly consider that because any new ideas coming along. Uh, what we're seeing is tremendous dispersion and it's happening quickly in all kinds of directions across all kinds of asset classes without yet signaling the intention of any of them. We've got intermediate term moves in the crypto market that could be rolling over right now. We, we're trying to get something going in the metals market. We tried to get something in the US stock market, which we did, new highs. And then we've come all the way back down except for the last four days, which is now putting us back in a position you start putting cash to work back in the market. So we promised we would get into more detail in the market. Um, and we touched on it a couple of days ago, but we will do that again. But any other ideas, just let us know. And um, with that, I will say uh, goodbye. And any final words, Socrates? Um, I, nothing, nothing final coming to mind. I think we covered everything that we wanted to. Um, we'll be trying to do these um, regularly and keep them shorter, but sometimes there's just too much for us to talk about. And uh, we, we will go on as, as long as there are important things um, on the charts that we are looking at. Uh, so appreciate everybody um, tuning in and we will look forward to chatting with you again soon. <laughs> Great. Thank you.